is Joy News Prime. All right, welcome to another edition of Joy News Prime here on Joy News on Multi TV. Coming up, erratic power outages causes anxiety amongst customers of the electricity company of Ghana over fears of a possible return to the worst form of the energy crisis. We'll hopefully get some answers from the Deputy Energy Minister. Minority in Parliament warned the November 7 date for this year's election may be in jeopardy because of the posture of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. Former Chief Executive of the Public Procurement Authority says individuals involved in the bus branding saga could go to jail for at least five years if they're found to have breached the law. And coming up in business, industry players criticize Bank of Ghana over attempts to pay back part of TKM depositors' funds, saying the action could send wrong signals in the industry. But also in the bulletin, we have entertainment, we have sports, and we have Joy News Interactive. This bulletin is also available across Europe by ABN Television. My name is Israel Lai, the news now in detail. Now, fears of a possible return to the days of persistent blackouts have been heightened in the last few days following prolonged outages in parts of the country. Communities in the western part of Accra appear to be the ones most affected by the outages. These customers are clearly not amused by the experiences over the last few days. I live in Latifia Koshi, Sukura. The time that I've been in the house, that it, went off, it, didn't, it didn't last. It came back you know, within 5, 10, 20 minutes. I have been to areas where... You know, the light goes off one hour, two hours, and, you know, there's no explanation to that. And the EC doesn't, you know, give any official, you know, notice to that. So um, I think the, 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 the ECG, ECG should, you know, prior to the lights going off, you know, at least an announcement should be made to that effect. And then people will understand them in that in that uh, direction. Yeah, my life went up at Taifa. But when I got home, it was off. So later in the night, it came on again. Then it went off again. Then this morning, around I think three, four, then it came back. As and I'm here, I don't have a um, body call. The next information for me to conclude that Dimsa is back. It's back. <laughs> it's certainly. Well, why do you <laughs> because why not? How things are going? Because when it improved, it was really stable. But right now, it just goes up erratic, on and off, anytime without any warning. And that's very bad because you are not announcing here. People are doing business and thinks the thing is over. But at the end of the day, you will lose because it's still going on. So I don't think it's over. It's back. Meanwhile, a significant portion of the Ashanti regional capital, Kumasi, was reported to have also been without electricity. Officials of the Electricity Company of Ghana, they explain there simply wasn't enough electricity to go round. Our checks in the last hour indicate power has been restored to the city. In the central region, we're also told the Ghana Grid Company, Grid has requested the ECG to shed about 20 megawatts of power due to a fall in generation. This means Salt Pond, Praso, Elmina and parts of Cape Coast would be without electricity. But what's been the cause of these outages? We've been hoping to get to speak with the Deputy Power Minister, John Jinapo. Where we agreed uh, to, he agreed to get to speak with us. We'll try and still reach him on the line. In the meantime, we're going to be moving on to uh, other stories whilst we make our uh, continued efforts to try to reach the uh, Deputy Power Minister. Now, individuals found to have broken the law in the Smarties Bars branding saga could end up in jail for not less than five years. A former chief executive of the Public Procurement Authority, Janine Boatinje, says a waiver given for the 3.6 million CD contract to be sole source could also be revoked if it is proving that the PPA was misled. It's one of the stories we'll be looking at this evening. But right now, the minority in parliament is warning it may be compelled to resist the proposed amendment to the 1992 constitution that will see the date 
for the general elections move to November instead of December. Join you says learn that the first gazette of the proposal has been tabled in Parliament awaiting the mandatory three-month period before it can be sent to the Council of State for advice. The Electoral Commission has meanwhile been already planning with the proposed November 7 date. But Deputy Minority Leader Dominic Nitu tells parliamentary correspondent Elton Brobe the posture of the EC chairperson has been unhelpful to the cause. The political parties, major political parties, seem to be working towards that particular calendar. But a lot of things can change, you know, in politics. So many things can change. Fortunes can change within a day, within a month. So I believe that the political parties will consult widely. And you know that for that amendment to succeed, mm -hmm. both the MPP and the NDC for once must agree. If one side says no, then that's it. We, we are back to December 7th. That's a problem that we have. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why some time ago I cautioned the letter commissioner that she should not be, she should not be viewed as listening to one side only. Mm -hmm. Or she should not be, be seen, her action should not be seen as leaning towards one side. Because if she does that, she could have major, major problems in her work. And it would be a big indictment on her if all her plans are thrown overboard because of her posture, because of all her posturing, or because of the way she goes about her duties. I, we just w w wait as MPs, as leaders in parliament, and see how these things will go. But as far as election is concerned? I know that at the APAC level, parties are talking among themselves. Informally, parties are also talking among themselves. But look, come on, we need to engage as a country. It's one country. It's our country. We don't have another country. We need to engage. We need to move forward and see how this country can be shaped. But until it is done, we need to consult. So in this particular instance of the constitutional amendments, the parties have to consult widely. They shouldn't assume. If they assume, I believe that one day they will come back to bite out it. Particular letter commission, because they have tied their programs to that part. Yeah. They need to consult widely with the political parties. It is very important for them. They really need to. They should not assume that everything is done and dusted, and so they can just push. It's not like that. There are so many interests that play into these things, and uh, timing is one major thing when it comes to elections. And so if, if they don't consult widely, they may come to regret it. Majority Leader Bambagbe is however hopeful all differences will be addressed before the consideration of the House. He explains, though, a lot of work needs to be done before amendments can be approved. From the provisions in the Constitution, uh, the date as of now is 7th of December. But looking at our experience uh, in the transition of the various uh, changes that we've had so far, we've definitely had difficulties. And so the whole country has come together and they proposed that we shift it from the 7th of December to the 7th of November. A bill to that effect will be coming before the House. Now, looking at the chapter on the amendment to constitutional provisions, it's rather very tedious and uh, time-consuming. Uh, you need to gazette the, the, that bill, specifically meant for the amendment of the Constitution, twice. And between the first gazetting and the second gazetting, you need three months. And after the second gazetting, you need about 10 days before it's laid in the House and it's referred to the Council of State and takes some uh, about 30 days before it comes back to the House. And that is why people are worried whether we have enough time to be able to pass that bill before uh, we rise at the end of July. But I did indicate to members that if that is the case, there's a possibility of uh, an emergency recall of the House to consider the bill because it is very key to the success of our democracy. But as it is now legally, it's still December 7th, but the proposal is that we should change it to November 7th. And we have all agreed that November 7th is, is a better or is a preferred date to December 7th. It's just the details, the procedure, the processes that we are going through. And I'm sure we, we, we are capable of passing that law before that due date. Well, Parliament resumed Tuesday after a two-month break. Key on the agenda for the first meeting will be the consideration of the Presidential Transition Amendment Bill and several others. The Speaker, Edward Roja, who is demanding punctuality from MPs to enable the House to discharge its duties effectively before rising at the end of July. 
He asked MPs to attach more seriousness to the Right to Information Bill. Now, one of the leading personalities pushing for the passage of the Right to Information Bill, Akoto Ampa, describes the Speaker's comments as reassuring, but says it will be meaningless without the amendment proposed by the Select Committee. It is a welcome, you know, observation and declaration and directive from the Speaker that the, the House ought to take the passage of the bill into law seriously and hopefully pass it into law before they rise sometime in July. But it would be meaningless without the amendments that the Select Committee is proposing the House adopts. The Constitution since 1993 has given citizens the right to information subject to conditions what uh, was subject to limitations and qualifications that are necessary in a democratic society those are the words of the constitution it is the obligation of parliament to spell out what those conditions and qualifications are that are limitations are that are necessary in a democratic society and if almost, you know, 1993 and we are in 2016. That's two decades. Yes, and more. And two decades and more. This law hasn't, this critical law has not been passed. I think that uh, it, it doesn't speak well of our, our parliament. And because of that, it is my view that parliament has to live up to its expectations as honorable people and ensure that a good right to information law, not any right to information law, but a good and effective right to information law is passed. Communications Minister Dr. Mani Boama has revealed there are plans to make it possible for mobile and phone subscribers to switch from one network to another in the event of a network failure known as domestic roaming services. It's an attempt to improve network coverage for mobile phones and data users. Dr. Mani Boama was speaking at a forum to commemorate World Telecommunication and Information Society Day in Accra, reiterated government has no plans to ban calls made over WhatsApp and other similar applications. The minister's assurance is informed by public angst against proposals to restrict calls made over internet-based applications such as WhatsApp, Viber, Emo, and others. I wish to state emphatically that government is not and has not in any way considered a ban on OTT services. We believe that as an emerging trend, the regulator, together with operators and consumers, should find a middle ground which benefits our peculiar situation. The forum itself brought together all the stakeholders in the telecommunications sector to dialogue on how to improve services. According to Dr. Mani Buama, the move, if adopted by the stakeholders, domestic roaming will go a long way to improve productivity and security. You would agree with me that there are telecom coverage gaps as you drive from one region to another and one district to another. Domestic or national roaming is when the geographical area where the customer roams is within the same country as the customer's mobile operator. An implementation of such a transformation will stimulate, promote, and encourage innovation and furthermore provide the required quality of service while developing a reliable communications infrastructure. This service will enable mobile users to switch from one network to the other in the event of network failure. Furthermore, this will ultimately be of an advantage to the police, the security agencies, in the event of crisis and mass information that they will need to address these. As planning to join news on the sidelines of the event, the Director of Engineering at the National Communication Authority, Henry Cano, however cautioned domestic roaming service also has its own challenges. Domestic roaming have also its problems, so you need to discuss it well with the operators, list it to everybody before we can push so it. Obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's no free lunch in the way. If uh, you want to be on your same network, and speak to anybody when you are doing, like you say you are doing well, it means there should be some increment on the on the, the tariff that you pay when you are roaming. 
on the issue of roaming charges at the border towns, he explained the mobile operators headed by the NTA will be meeting their counterparts from the neighboring countries to work out some arrangement. I have given us a letter complaining that some of our operators have higher signals into the area. So it means that people in Lome are roaming in Lome, which means we are also have here. So we have arranged a meeting that will go and then go with some of the take-up people of the operators to do that. The situation in the north Burkina is a bit okay. And in the, the western border too, because the whole area is plantation. This is the first in a series of stakeholder consultations in the telecom sector to improve services. Russian Joy News Prime, we're returning to our top story where fears of a possible return to the dates of persistent blackouts have been heightened in the last few days following prolonged outages in parts of the country. We have on the line right now the Deputy Minister of Power, John Jinapo, to hopefully give us uh, some information as to what exactly is happening. Good evening to you, sir, and thank you for making time. Now, what is your understanding of the challenges we're experiencing with electricity supply in recent times? Uh, thank you very much. And um, my regards to all of you. First of all, you do recall that the FPS went down, which created a bit of a problem. And we had to commence the process of switching some of the thermal plants from gas to LCO, that is liquid. The good news is that the Ministry of Petroleum, in collaboration with its agencies, have been able to restore the FPSO back into the system. And so as I speak to you, we have commenced receiving some gas from the FPSO. The other side of it is that once you receiving gas, you must then commence the process of switching the thermal plants back from LCO to gas. And this takes a bit of time. And so currently, Ameri is running on gas, but we are in the process of switching the other plant, which requires that sometimes you have to put the plant off, take some time to clean it, and then commence the process of bringing it back on gas. And this takes some few days. And so we expect that in the next coming days, we should be able to successfully switch some of the plants back and then eventually normalize the situation. All right, the issue with the FPSO, my understanding is that uh, we, we're really not having enough gas coming from the FPSO because the FPSO itself is not produ producing up to optimum capacity. Yes, yeah, it's not producing at full capacity, but at least they're getting some gas from the FPSO, so, which is good news. Yeah, so the gas that's coming in, would it be enough for all the plants in the Western Enclave or probably for just a Mary? It may not be enough for all the Western enclaves, but the other side is that we have procured enough crude to fire the remaining plants on live crude. And so as I speak to you yesterday, we discharged the full parcel in Takradi, as well as some in Tema. And so we are working on the plants. All plants that can run on live crude, we have some crude to run on that. And so we'll keep monitoring the situation I'm sure that in the coming days, the picture will become clearer. Now, that takes care of the Western Enclave. How about the Tema Enclave, where we have uh, Bung and Senate and the rest, and I'm told the number of them are down? In fact, the plants are ready. Almost all the plants in Tema are ready. We have excess capacity in terms of availability of machines. But sometimes the challenge is the gas from Nigeria. As I speak to you, there's been vandalism on some pipelines in Nigeria, and especially the Focados pipeline. This has affected the flow of gas from Nigeria. And so a Sogli, which could potentially give us about 360, is unable to run at full capacity. But we have brought enough crude, at least for the plants like Senate, that can run on crude. They will run on crude. In fact, Senate just came on this evening. And so we are treating more fuel, and all things being equal, tomorrow we should continue with Senate. We are working on some other plants so that they can also run on light crude. And even with KTPP, we have procured diesel 
In fact, that is one of the most difficult decisions because to run a plant on diesel is quite expensive. But in our quest to ensure that we stabilize the situation, we have procured diesel to run KTPP on diesel. And so we would appeal to consumers to remain calm. Uh, I'm sure that in the next couple of days, we should get a very clear picture as to the situation. What is going to happen in the next couple of days that, uh, for each reason, the consumers should be reassured? As I said, we are in the process of firing this plant on the fuel available. If we have gas, it only makes sense that we switch to gas. But in the event that we don't have enough gas, we'll switch back to the crew that we have purchased. And so we should begin to see improvements going forward. Now, can you confirm for us that in, uh, on the 20th of this month, uh, the FPSO is going to go down again? I haven't received official communication but yet. But you're aware of it? I've heard that, but I believe that it's always proper to speak on authority. And so we'll be communicating with the Ministry of Petroleum tomorrow so that we have an official position from them. All right. On the Nigeria gas situation, we've heard about the vandalism and the fact that as a result of that vandalism, we're not getting gas coming through. But how much of the lack of gas from Nigeria have to do with the debt we owe them? It's not directly related. But we it is a related. We meeting with the Nigerians last week. And indeed, we have agreed on the payment plan. As of last week, we did some payments. This week, we intend doing some payments. There can never be a day when you wouldn't owe some amount because as you keep consuming, they give you bills. But we do acknowledge that we owe them some money and we need to make some payments. But equally, if you don't give me the gas to run the plants, if I don't get the gas to run the economy and to produce, it becomes difficult for us to continue paying. And so we have agreed with them on a common roadmap, and that for me is, is good. But they also do have challenges with vandalism. And vandalism has nothing to do with the debt that you owe somebody. But we shall keep working with our Nigerian counterparts. Right, one final question, uh, Mr. Jinapo. There has, in the last few days, been some agitations from workers of the electricity company of Ghana regarding the introduction of a private sector player into the distribution sector, into the operations. How is government reacting to the concerns of the workers? We shall continue to engage the staff of ECG. We shall continue to explain issues to them. If they have any concerns, our doors are open as a government. We believe that the option of the concession is in the best interest of not just ECG, but of the entire nation. And so if they have any concerns within the spirit of collaboration and also ensuring that we accommodate each other, we shall sit with them, we shall engage them. The process is not completely over yet. Uh, there's room for us to make improvements. There's room for us to take suggestions so that the interests of the staff are catered for. But more importantly, the overall interest of the nation, because it's not just about one section. But we want a resilient power sector. And so we must make some changes at ECG. We must bring in the private sector to partner with us so that we can continue to improve the system. And so whatever concerns they have, uh, we shall meet them, and I'm sure that we can iron out our difference. Now, is there a proposal for the floating of ECG on the stock mm -hmm. exchange one of the options you want to consider? I think we have gone very far. Uh, we consider so many options including the flotation. In the current state of ECG, I'm not sure that any financial analyst or expert would advise us to float it. You normally float a company on the stock exchange when it's doing well. But if you look at the debt level, we require a company that will not just come and run ECG, but invest substantially in the company. And so we need to look at that option as well. And that is why government told that the option of the concession was a good one. Uh, it went to Parliament. Both sides of the divide thought that it was a good one and passed it. We signed a compact with our American partners, and they also invested in about $500 million, which is quite a huge amount, in order to turn the company around. I'm sure that when we go through the concession, 
and we're able to turn the company around. And that's why we are not selling ECG. The company is not for sale. After the period of the concession, we have the right to take over and probably list it on the Ghana Stock Exchange. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. John, G John Ginepo. John Ginepo is the Deputy Power Minister. He was throwing more light on the challenges we are experiencing in the electricity subsector. Now, individuals found to have broken the law in the smartest bus branding saga could end up in jail for not less than five years. A former chief executive of the Public Procurement Authority, Ejenim Boating Eje, says the waiver giving the 3.6 million city contract to be sole sourced could also be revoked if it is proving that the PPA was misled. He was speaking on Joy FM Super Morning Show on the infamous scandal which has led to the resignation of the transport minister and the return of 1.5 million cities of the amount paid the company. An investigation ordered by the chief of staff into the scandal found out that Smartis was overpaid by 1.9 million cities, monies it was ordered to refund. It is also speculated that the Attorney General made far-reaching recommendations, including the prosecution of some public officials involved in the transaction. Government is, however, refusing to make public the recommendations for which reason pressure group Occupy Ghana has vowed to go to court to compel full disclosure. Available documents on the controversial bus branding contract indicate that approval was sought from the Public Procurement Authority after the contract had already been executed. The former Public Procurement Authority CEO, Ajenim Boatin Ejay, says this could have significant repercussions. Any person who contravenes any provision of this act commits an offense. So if somebody was supposed to obtain a prior approval, from procurement. Prior approval means approval before contract. So if an entity has awarded a contract prior to obtaining approval, that person has contravened the act. He added that a prison term of not less than five years awaits suspects if investigators are able to establish a case of collusion between the smarties and the transport ministry. If in, in, the, in the opinion of procurement authority or the outcome of the procurement investigation reveals that there has been a contravention, then the procurement authority can invoke Section 92, which deals with offenses. And I tell you, in Section 92, let me tell you that that sanction could lead to uh, a fine not exceeding 1,000 penalty units or five years imprisonment or both. The former CEO of Public Procurement Authority said if the law on procurement is obeyed, contracts awarded on the basis of sole sourcing cannot constitute more than 15% of all government contracts. We're taking a break on Joy News Prime. When we come back, we bring you business news. Time for business now, and uh, Emmanuel Abadjuriafi is here. Good evening to you, Good evening, Emmanuel. Israel. All right, what's coming up in business? Well, in business tonight, um, a banking consultant is actually warning the Bank of Ghana to be careful of paying part of DKM depositors' funds, you know, uh, okay. back to them. Okay. You know, it's been quite... No, I've um, actually been wondering thing. how the bank is going to do that, because I'm, I'm, my understanding is that they're going to sell... Part uh, of the... Uh, DKM's the debts. Debts, exactly. Who wants to buy junk? Well, it's, it's quite interesting, but you know, in business circles, uh, there, there are some kind of arrangements that uh, another financial institution can buy back the, the funds or the, the debts to uh, a different company. I think it's going to be difficult, though. But it anyway. is going to be very difficult. All right, you take it away. <laughs> All right, so banking consultant Nana Utue Champon says he is not happy with the attempts by the Bank of Ghana to pay part of DKM depositors' funds. And this could send wrong signals to the industry. He says it will not be prudent for the central bank to lead the process of paying depositors' funds of microfinance company DKM. This comes at a time when many microfinance companies have collapsed, whilst others are going through difficult times. Governor of the central bank yesterday announced that the bank has come very far in facilitating the payment of depositors' funds of DKM. But Nanotwe Champon maintains this will send wrong signals to the industry. 
not happy with me. Why? Uh, simply because DKM is not the only microfinance that has collapsed. There's uh, tens of other microfinances, and they also had depositors. So uh, to, to isolate DKM and give them special treatment is, is not the best. All right, so Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Abdul Nasiru Isahaku, maintains the payment is being done in a manner that will result in the regulator not directly paying the funds and to encourage moral hazard in the industry. Now, moving on, stakeholders of the mining industry are beginning to heave some sigh of relief as price of gold appears to be on the rebound trajectory. The commodity is now trading at around $1,275 an ounce, one of the highest in recent times. But CEO of the Minerals Commission, Dr. Tony Aubin, says it is early times to begin celebrating the turnaround. Speaking with Joy Business, Dr. Aubin said players are better off pegging their expected revenues at the lowest level. Gold price volatility has been quite significant over the past few years. The mineral saw its price increasing to almost $1,900 in 2012 and 2013, bringing a lot of excitement to mining operators and other industry players. A sharp decline, however, followed, which has persistently seen a price drop to as low as $1,000 an ounce. The outcome of this cannot be overemphasized. Many mining firms have virtually folded up, while many workers have lost their jobs. Gold-producing countries have had to suffer some revenue setbacks as well. However, over the past few months, gold price on the world market has been witnessing some kind of rebound. The commodity is now trading at around $1,275 an ounce, one of the highest in recent times. Speaking with Joy Business, CEO of the Minerals Commission, Dr. Tony Aubin, cautions players not to party yet. He advised them to benchmark their revenue based on a projection of, say, $1,000 an ounce in order to derive the maximum benefits should price increase persistently. Everybody is excited about the, the wonders in quote that we see. Um, we are very careful not to have a party yet. Uh, you know, we've seen how the volatility of the price in the last year or so. So you don't want to go to party because you've seen the price gone to 1,300. Remember that in 2012, 2013, it was almost 1,900. And so that's, the, that's, that's where uh, much as we are excited because if as a country we plan to get uh, our benefit based on maybe price of 1,000, then it is, uh, it is good for us to have price of 1,300. Again, for me personally, I haven't been in the industry for some time. I think the challenge is to me not the price. I, I always say this and people have issues. That I said the problem is not the price, the problem is the costs. On his part, Chief Executive of the Ghana Chamber of Mines, Suleiman Kony, is optimistic the rebound in price of the commodity would continue. According to him, the figures on the ground show that the price will increase much higher than it is currently. The price of gold has inched up to about 20% since it started recovering. We expect that um, it, should, it should go higher than, than it is, but this is better than what it was last year. Now, teachers of colleges of education in Ghana are threatening the withdrawal of their services by the end of the month over government's failure to migrate them onto the appropriate salary structure. According to them, after 12 years performing duties as teachers in the tertiary sector, government has refused to recognize them as such. The aggrieved teachers issued the ultimatum at a news conference in Cape Coast. It will be recalled that in the year 2004, Colleges of Education became diploma awarding institutions, just like polytechnics. That way, until recently, diploma awarding institutions in Ghana. The first batch of students successfully completed their diploma program in 2007. At the beginning of the diploma program in 2004, Colleges of Education were made to understand that some structures how to be put in place for a full takeoff of colleges of education as tertiary institutions in this country. 
It took government of Ghana eight long years, 2004 to 2012, to be precise, to put the necessary structures in place for the passage of the Colleges of Education Act, Act 847, in 2012. It is to be noted that the Colleges of Education Act was given a presidential assent by the late president, John Evans Atamels, in the same year, that is in 2012. We, the tutors of the Colleges of Education in Ghana, thought that the eight-year period, 2004 to 2012, that the past governments of Ghana used to put relevant structures in place before passing. Now, presidential candidate of the Convention People's Party, Ivo Greenstreet, Monday afternoon took his campaign tour to Zevila in the Baku West District of the Upper East Region. The campaign dubbed Akwam Fufro Tour is to afford the CPP the opportunity to meet and interact with people at the grassroots. Upper East correspondent Albertori joined the tour and came through with his report. The tour was led by chairman and leader of the Convention People's Party, Professor Edmond Dele. Together with Upper East Regional Executives of the party, CPP presidential candidate Ivor Greenstreet paid a courtesy call on the chief of Zebula and his elders. Addressing a mini rally at the Zebula market later, Mr. Greenstreet bemoaned the state of affairs in the country and called on the people to look beyond his disability and vote for him for competent leadership. Leader like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, yes. you notice that when he left, yes. he did not have any house, he did not have any bank accounts, he did not have any money. That is because he came to serve. He did not come to serve himself. And that is what we need from our leaders. Those who come and leave a memory in the hearts and minds of the people that they came to offer them opportunity and progress. Chairman and leader of the CPP, Professor Edmond Dele, assured the youth that the CPP is the best alternative to govern the country, create jobs and give them hope. Because if you can't pay your child's school fees, if you can't access health care, if you can't find employment, then you are disabled by your conditions of life. So just imagine if on top of that you have a sight impairment, a hearing impairment or a physical impairment, then it is double, double for you. But meanwhile, all the laws are there. The Disability Act is there. The UN Convention is there. But why is it taking them so long to implement all of these things that the people deserve? Just imagine, even the 2% common fund that we're supposed to get doesn't come in time. So, so much more needs to be done. That is why we need change. That is why we need car power. That's why we need a new way forward. Mr. Greenstreet and Professor Dele also used the opportunity to introduce to the people the CPP's parliamentary candidate for Boko West, Benjamin Anafo. The team also made a stop at Bogatanga for a similar address. His next step on this leg of the tour will take him to Sandema in the Bulsa South District. Meanwhile, here in Accra, the presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party, Nana Adudanko Kufado, is promising to create jobs for Ghanaians. He said this among many other promises when he toured the trouble constituency in the Greater Accra region Tuesday afternoon. Here are excerpts. <laughs> I came to promise you and also request something from you. We are in an election year and all I need from you are your votes. My promise is to provide jobs for the youth and work on the economy because when the economy is good, jobs are created. I need your support. The MP here is like an orphan because he's an opposition. When I'm president, he'll be stronger. Whatever we need to do to make Ofanko a better place, we will. Roads prepaid, among others. Yeah. 
That's why I said Janka. Only Papa. I'm not in the hook of Kanoa. I'll say that I'm not here. 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 All right, Gary Al Smith is here for, with sports. Good evening to you, Gary. Hi, Israel. Yeah. What's coming up in sports? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for joining us for the sports on Prime. Hi, I'm Gary Al Smith. Today we have some athletics, also some Euro 2016 fair in the Barclays Premier League. Man United are playing Bournemouth in the final game of the season that was postponed. But first, we begin with the news that, as you know, the Olympics begin in August, on the 5th of August, actually, and Ghana is getting prepared. This afternoon, we got the great news that a judoka um, has qualified for the Olympic Games, making it the seventh athlete from the country who's made it confirmed to Rio. The Ghana Athletics Association President, Professor Francis Dodu, has reiterated their commitment to stepping up preps within the next four weeks. Uh, across the water, you know half of our athletes are overseas. Across the water, it's just been in the last two or three weeks that the weather has changed. It's actually warmed up. They've gone out of spring into, well, they've gone out of winter into spring now. And so um, three weeks ago, uh, uh, Georgia Fa was competing in Ohio and it was snowing while they were running. So it's, it's only been in the last two weeks and in the next four weeks that you'll see the performances, the uh, Olympic approach performances. Um, by the same token, we were in, uh, on on Cinder in, in Bogatanga and on, on grass in Kufuria. And the first time that our circuit got onto the tartan was in Takradi last month. So again, it's from last month going for the next four, five, six weeks that we should expect to see the, the, the people who can qualify actually step up. People have made a lot of noise about uh, athletes having qualified and whatnot. But you know something, um, 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 I think it's, it's the time now that we should expect that athletes will step up and show whether they want to go to the Olympics or not.